Good morning again, everybody. My name's Tyler. It's uh, my privilege to open God's word with you this morning. So if you would just bow your heads with me uh, one more time. Uh, Lord, what a privilege to do what we have done um, together already this morning of hearing God's word in call to worships and in scripture readings and responding to your grace in the singing of songs, in praying for your people. And now, Lord, as we submit ourselves intentionally under your word for a time of instruction, we pray that your grace continues to abound among us, and that you bring good news to the hearts of those who need it. You bring repentance to hearts stuck in sin, and you bring change to hearts that are calloused in their hardships. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, a couple years ago, uh, John Loon and I went to a conference in Oregon, and it was my job to secure the rental car when we got over there. And so I called the, the rental car company, and I was talking to this lady who sounded like she was talking to me on a phone that was across the room from where she was sitting. And so it's one of those conversations where you say, like, I, I can't hear you, um, but you say that enough and they resolve it enough that now it's just awkward to keep bringing it up. And so still not hearing her, we continued with the reservation. Um, and we were flying into Portland, and so I was trying to reserve. Um, I don't know why I didn't use the internet. Like, the internet didn't exist on this day. But here I was on the phone with this lady. And uh, she's like, you want the Portland airport? I'm like, yeah, the Portland airport. And she's like, you want the main Portland airport? And I was like, uh, I've flown into Portland a number of times. I know there's a bunch of municipal airports in the area. So I'm like, yeah, the main Portland airport, PDX. And uh, we're like yelling at each other over the, the audio issues with the phone call. And so we land in Portland and we go to the rental desk and I go to check in and they say, we do have a car reserved for you at the Portland airport and it's in Portland, Maine and you're welcome to go and get it there. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you might all have had, hopefully to a lesser degree, situations like that where you quickly realize the old idiom that the devil is in the details, that this phrase expresses that small things, such as the word main, either being an adjective or a noun, can derail whatever it is you're working on. The small things, the intricate themes in life really do matter. And what's interesting is if you research that phrase, no one really knows where it came from, but they've traced it back to a German proverb, which is probably its origin, which says from the opposite side that God is in the details. That the details are important. The details are where the things matter. And today we are looking at seven chapters in the book of Deuteronomy. Seven chapters of law. And in fact, I went back and looked. Uh, we're doing the F260 Bible reading plan together here at church. If you haven't, you could go back and you could grab uh, a guide for those in the back. We have reading groups on Wednesdays. And uh, the, what this reading plan accomplishes is over 260 days, five days a week, you will have spent time in every book of the Bible. And so they're selectively picking um, kind of key texts that explain the story of God's salvation in Scripture. And they have selectively not included any of these chapters we're looking at today. And some of these laws that we see are detailed. That some laws determine the kinds of fabrics you can intermix with one another. One regulates the way in which soldiers can use the bathroom while on the battlefield. Another law regulates the use of just scales and weights in the marketplace. Another one prescribes capital punishment for children who obstinately rebel continuously against their parents. And another law limits the kind of trees which Israel is to use when building siege work for a war. In the ESV translation, the translation we're using here today, the word shall in its various forms, you shall, he shall, they shall, the city shall, is used 179 times. Those 179 shalls are grouped together in what is, to my count, at least 64 individual laws spanning six key areas of Israelite life, all of which confirm the truth that for God's people, God is indeed in the details. <laughs> 
And this is something we've been alluding to since we started chapter 12 of Deuteronomy. Chapter 12 through 26 of Deuteronomy is Moses giving these detailed laws about God's people. And the point is that when God delivers you, when he takes you out of Egypt, when he brings you out of slavery to sin, everything changes, including the details of your life. Paul picks up on this in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians where we've seen he says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. And as we're looking at these laws, the basis of it is simple. The basis of these laws are the holiness of God and our response to it. God is holy. I am holy. We see all the time in Deuteronomy, four times in this sermon of Deuteronomy, Moses reminds God's people that not only is God holy, but as God's people, you are holy. You are set apart. And God's law exists to protect God's people as set apart. It protects them as holy so that they might have the benefit of enjoying God, being with their holy God. A holy God demands holy people, and the law is what keeps them there. So in light of all of this, we're going to spend time today uh, going into a detailed exegesis of all 64 laws in 10-minute increments. And then we can have more burritos. Uh, No, what we're going to do is we're going to look at three key truths about the law that we see in Scripture. And we're going to see what that means for us. And first, we're going to see the problem of the law, the principles of the law, and the priority of the law. So we're going to see the problem the law provides, the principles which uh, make up the law, and then the priority that stands as the chief center of the law. And because of the scope of our text today being how broad it is, um, I'm going to summarize a lot of what we see here, but I encourage you to go home and read chapters 19 through 26 of Deuteronomy. And you'll see um, kind of this big outline. Our first two points are going to deal with chapters 19 through 25. And then the last point is going to deal with chapter 26. And so to see this first, we're going to start with our first point, which is the problem of the law the problem of the law. And in summary, this is the problem. We can't keep it. That's the problem it provides. And we actually see this problem manifest itself both internally and externally. And both of those challenges, the internal and the external challenge, has to be reconciled in Jesus Christ if we want to have peace with it. What do I mean when I say internally we have a problem with the law? Well, have you ever had twinges of guilt? Have you ever seen people who were performing better than you and you felt, I know that's what I should do? You see, the truth is, regardless of what you believe or who you claim to follow, our hearts are always measuring themselves to something, aren't they? We're measuring ourselves to the person who's less than us, saying, well, at least I'm not that bad. Or we're measuring ourselves to the person who is better than us, and we try to find faults in what they're doing to be like, well, at least I do this. That's because God made us to be measured against something. And every time we run into that, every time societies are grasping for morality, we are recognizing the truth that we have an internal compass for something. But the Bible gives us clarity on what that is. And so those challenges, those internal debates that we see the Israelites can't keep the law. Paul in the New Testament talks about the pain of himself trying to follow the law. That is a testimony to the problem of the law. We can't keep it and we're burdened by what it is we're measured up against. But externally, the law provides a challenge as well. And this one's a little unique because what the law often does is it allows for people, both secular people and sometimes Christian people, to leverage the law against Jesus. Have you ever seen people do this? Where they take the law, which is part of God's word, and they use it against God's word. They try to drive a wedge between which parts of the Bible we obey and which God it is we're talking about at that current moment in time. Consider, for example, Deuteronomy 22, verse 12, one of the laws we're going to look at today. It says this, you shall make yourself tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself. So, raise your hand if you have tassels on all the corners of your garments you're wearing today. My daughter probably does somewhere. (laughs) And what happens is, religious professors or secular scholars, they say, well, if you're not going to keep this, you can't keep any of the Bible's moral commands. And if you claim to keep any of the Bible's moral commands, then you need to keep all of the Bible's moral commands. And you obviously don't do that. 
Or there are people who look at the hard laws we see today, Christians. And there are hard laws, hard laws prescribing the death penalty, hard laws that deal with the eradication of seven different types of people groups inside of the promised land. But instead of reading it in light of what's going on and the history of it, it leads so many Christians to resolve this tension by just cutting off the significance of the Old Testament. They try to come up with this idea that God had like this mid-eternity crisis at some point, and the God of the Old Testament was angry and curmudgeon and the God of the New Testament is loving and gracious. And so because we have this New Testament Jesus and God, we can just disregard all of the Old Testament. But the Bible speaks for itself. When you encounter those external problems, I want you to know that I think it's Charles Spurgeon who once said that we don't need to let the Bible defend itself any more than we need to let a lion out of its cage defend itself. It does it on its own. When we rightly read God's word, it turns out you can't use God's word against him. You can use my words against me because I say dumb things. You can't use God's word against him. And to answer both the internal of our own conscience and the external of the challenge of having someone who's giving commands, we have to see how Jesus reconciles the whole law in and of himself. How does Jesus treat the law? How does Jesus treat the Old Testament? Well, first, what is, how does Jesus talk about the Old Testament? Was the law a problem for Jesus? Did Jesus see that the law stood, and maybe you've heard this, that anything in the Old Testament is just legalism? And we need to get rid of the Old Testament because it's legalistic. Well, what's interesting is that Jesus actually uses the law as a weapon against legalism. When it came to fighting the legalism of the the Pharisees, it was the law that Jesus used to fight legalism. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him? How he entered into the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests." Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? That's that the priests are eating and they are guiltless. Jesus isn't intimidated by the law. Neither should we be. In fact, Jesus uses it more than a tool. Jesus loves the law. Look at how Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 10. And here we see something new. It's not new that people try to pit the law against Jesus. That's what the very Pharisees are doing in this text, beginning in chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This man is quoting Deuteronomy, the law to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Now, Jesus is going to go on to define the weight of that law. But to Jesus, the law was good. He loved the law. That's what the law, to to worship God rightly meant to follow and obey the law. And specifically, Jesus loved Deuteronomy. Out of all the books of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy is the book Jesus himself quotes the most. To get rid of Deuteronomy is actually to get rid of a large portion of Jesus' teachings, including his moral teachings. But more than loving the law, Jesus kept the law. He was circumcised on the eighth day to keep the law. He was presented at the temple as a firstborn to keep the law. He observed the Sabbath to keep the law. He observed the Passover feast to keep the law. But in keeping the law, Jesus accomplished far more than you and I could in keeping the law. And that's because Jesus wasn't merely a man. Jesus was fully God and fully man. 
the second person of the Trinity, bodily dwelling, the fullness of God in the flesh. And when Jesus kept the law by obeying everything in the law, he fulfilled the law. Look with me at Matthew 5, 17 through 20. This is Jesus speaking. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. That term law and prophets is generally just shorthand for the entire Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what's Jesus' point here? The point is, is as our hearts tell us, we are constantly measuring ourselves to something. And what we are measuring ourselves to is God's standard of righteousness, God's standard of perfection, his standard of goodness, his standard of holiness. That is what we were meant to live life as. But in order to meet that requirement and to not be condemned by it, means you had to have righteousness that exceeded that of even the Pharisees, the superstar obeyers. You had to be more holy than even they were. And Jesus is using this point rhetorically, meaning you can't be. You cannot be good enough to meet this law. I have to meet it. Everyone fails at obeying the law. This is why Moses includes in Deuteronomy, and we've seen it throughout Deuteronomy, Cases of punishment. Why does punishment exist? Because Moses knows people are going to fail. And he knows that when you fail, discipline is needed. Look at what Moses says in one of these cases of discipline. In Deuteronomy 21, 22 through 23. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. And so Moses, at the back end of this text, is saying that because this land is good and holy, it shouldn't be littered with rotting corpses. It's a holy land. But he's also affirming that sometimes when punishment is worthy of the death penalty, that that man is to hang in public on a tree as a warning of the weight of breaking the law so that you might stand in fear and say, I don't want that to be me. I choose to obey. He tells them that those who have broken the law are under the curse of God. But Paul grabs this text from Deuteronomy 21 and look at what he does with it in Galatians chapter 3. Beginning in verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone. So he's actually quoting Deuteronomy here again. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by faith. So what is he saying here? Now he's coming to a summary. No one meets the law. What does this mean? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, here he goes to quote Deuteronomy 21, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So why did Jesus have to die? It's funny how many theological systems come about based off the answer you have to that question. Why did Jesus have to die? Jesus died, hung on a tree, to show us firsthand the weight of breaking God's law. Breaking God's law demanded death. 
The greatest commandment Moses gave, the summary commandment of all the law we saw earlier in Deuteronomy that we saw the lawyer quote to Jesus himself, which Jesus affirmed is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. To break that at any point, James tells us, is to break the whole law. This is not grading on a curve. This is pass fail. To have failed at any point in worshiping God, to have failed at any point of loving other people, is to be under the curse of the law. And seeing the cross of Christ reminds us of the wages of our sin. It demands death. That's the problem of the law. But more than that, more than simply reminding us of the penalty, Paul says Christ became the curse for you. He became the curse for you. When ISIS moved into Syria, a couple years ago, there was a group of journalists who began reporting on social media over the internet the atrocities of the ISIS regime. And what happened was ISIS didn't like it. It was breaking what they thought was codes of good conduct, of keeping the ISIS caliphate in well-thought-of order. And so what they did is they began to hunt down these journalists. And when they would find one, they would execute him, and they would hang his body in the public square. And they did this to show the kind of punishment that such lawlessness endured. They did it so that other journalists would see it and think twice about how they're living their lives. Which meant the rest of the journalists in these ISIS-controlled cities, they knew the weight and the risk of their rebellion. And they spend their lives living in the shadows trying to avoid the same sentence. They still lived as cursed men. And maybe that's how you feel when it comes to hearing the Bible's words on righteousness and obedience and judgment, that you see the wages of your sin and you are terrified of what God might do if he were to find you. But when Jesus became the curse for us, when he was hanged on a tree in our place, he not only warns us of the danger of sin, but he actually removes the curse from us by becoming the curse for us. When we see what Jesus has done, it actually calls us out of the shadows of sin and into the open because as Paul says in Romans 8, we no longer live as condemned men. Christ has set us free and there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ's, Christ Jesus Jesus is not just a reminder of the punishment of law-breaking. He is actually the substitute for your law-breaking. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is that Jesus obeyed perfectly and you didn't. And Jesus went to the cross for sins he didn't commit so that he could give his righteousness to those who had committed them. Do you believe that Jesus, brothers and sisters, freedom from the curse of sin does not come when you see the punishment of the cross. It comes when you see the substitution of the cross. The gospel is not just that sin demands death. You can find any religious system that tells you that your failures result in your death. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus loved us enough to take our punishment if we have faith in him. What a good God. But because of that, if we're found in Jesus, the law doesn't get erased. That's why we don't just cut off the first two-thirds of our Bible. In fact, we fulfill the law. All of the standards of the perfect law are fulfilled in us through Jesus. That's how perfect Jesus is. He was so perfect that his perfect fulfillment of all 64 of these laws, plus the hundreds of other laws in the Old Testament, he fulfilled them perfect enough that you get it too. That's how perfect Jesus is. The gospel doesn't lower God's standards for perfection. It accelerates ours through Jesus Christ. 
So why is it that we don't need to worry about the tassels on our clothes or the bacon in our bellies or the sausage we just had in those delicious breakfast burritos? Because Jesus already met those demands in himself. They are already fulfilled. We could walk about in the this, in this square, the public square freely because Jesus died in our place. And we are counted as one who is always and wholly obedient. Which means this, to speak derogatorily of the law, which in our age is becoming more and more common to hear Christians besmirge the law. To speak derogatorily of the law is to actually speak derogatorily of Jesus' love for you. The law stands as a reminder of that's how much Jesus loved me. That's how beautiful his obedience was. So Jesus spoke of the law because he loved the law. Jesus kept the law because he fulfilled the law. The question is, now what do we do with the law? How do we read this? What do we do with seven chapters of law in our Bible reading? Well, first, we recognize that this is still God's holy and inspired word. Jesus did not uninspire the Old Testament. God doesn't do that. This is his word for our good. But under the banner of God's word, we learn to read the Old Testament as Jesus did. Jesus sets the standard for how we read and interpret the Old Testament. And we do it in two ways. We read it in its historic context. Meaning when we're reading it, we understand that God was really speaking through his real prophet Moses to his real people Israel who are getting real laws and about to inherit a real land and they really needed God's word. But then we also read it redemptively. We read it in light of Jesus. That's to actually read the Old Testament backwards from the point of the cross. And this is actually the pattern that Jesus set for us in Luke chapter 24. After he is resurrected, he's talking to these two men and look at the guidance he gives them when it comes to hearing and understanding the Old Testament. Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. So he's talking about the Old Testament. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? What are these things? It's his death, burial, resurrection, and enter into glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus wants us to read the Old Testament, but he wants us to read the Old Testament in light of how Jesus has fulfilled the Old Testament. He wants us to read it in light of the ways that it points to him, things concerning himself. And this is our second point today. For us, as New Testament believers, how do we look at this law? Well, we look at the principles of the law. This is our second point today, the principles of the law. Jesus fulfilled the law, and then he calls us to go back and read the law, but to read it in light of him. And to do that, we need to begin to learn how to see redemptive principles in the law. And this is important because not only did Jesus fulfill the law, but we also see hard laws and, and seemingly easy laws. In fact, some of the laws we see today are remarkably liberal, even today, and they were certainly liberal in their time. We see laws for the sake of protecting nature. We see prohibitions, where the Israelites are prohibited of returning slaves to, to escape slaves to masters so that they might, might not be punished um, more than they should be. We see him seeking to protect the rights of women in both marriage and divorce. We see calls for the court to be unbiased when dealing with the vulnerable and neglected. But then we see laws that are seemingly more conservative. There are places even inside of difficult marriage where Moses prohibits divorce at any point. He prohibits cross-dressing and prostitution. He requires lex talionis, or eye for an eye, the law of retaliation. And in some cases enforces the death penalty on those caught in adultery. But as we read these laws, as you read these laws, some laws which might make you and your modern sensibilities squirm a little bit, we actually get glimpses into God's character. God takes justice, equity, community, and family seriously. How serious? Serious enough, enough to punish those who don't keep those standards. And as we look at those things, even the hard things, not only do we see God's holy character, but we see and are reminded of Jesus' perfection. Jesus kept all of those laws. 
all of them, to a T, for you. But more than just seeing God's righteousness and Jesus' perfection, we need to read them in terms of what they mean for us. Certainly, we don't look at the Old Testament law and try to fulfill it to the letter because Jesus already did that. But does this mean that the principles behind the laws are no longer helpful for us? I imagine that just because we read about Jesus fulfilling the law, we still would like to care for widows and orphans. We still would like to see justice in the courts and in our marketplaces. We still would like to see the family cared for and women protected. But instead of looking at the letter and exercising that, we learn to look at the heart behind the laws and we apply that to our own hearts and how we're responding in specific situations. Let me give you an example of this. This is how Paul teaches us how to interpret the law. And we see this via a rather obscure law from our passage in Deuteronomy today um, in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18. Paul says this, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says... You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So here Paul quotes Deuteronomy 25, 24. If you have your Bibles, you could turn there. 25, 24 says, am I in the right place here? 25, 4, excuse me. You shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. Now, what is Paul doing in this text besides calling preachers big, dumb oxen? He's giving us a principle here that we should look at when it comes to how we interpret the Bible. Because what we do know is that Moses, when he gave this sermon back on the plains of Moab, looking into the promised land, when he spoke to the people, Deuteronomy 25, 4, he was not thinking, this is going to be a great point of application for preaching pastors in the New Testament. So does that mean that we get to grab onto any old metaphor in the Old Testament and just interpret it however we want to. No. Paul was doing the good work of Bible reading. He was expositing this because he noticed something in Deuteronomy, the back half of 24 and the first part of 25. Look at this thrust. In the back half of 24, Moses begins a series of laws that start like this. Don't withhold wages from a worker. Give him his due. Don't punish a father for his son's sins. They each get what they're owed. Don't pervert justice. Everyone is do it. Don't overharvest your fields. You have enough food, but leave some for those who also deserve to eat. If a man needs to be punished, punish him, but don't punish him beyond what he needs. And then lastly, don't muzzle an ox when he's treading out grain. Now, here's the thing. In 1 Timothy, Paul is saying, pay your pastors. Pay some of your pastors, those who labor in preaching and teaching. It would have been really, really clear and really, really simple for Paul to go to Deuteronomy 24, where it says, pay your worker. That's really clear. But he didn't. He went to this portion on an ox. Why? Because Paul realized this section of the law has to do with people getting what they're owed. People getting what they're due. And here he says, if an ox get what he owes, while he works, don't you think your preaching elders should too? He's expositing the principle behind it, and he's saying even though the law has been fulfilled to the letter in Jesus, he says you can still apply the heart of it today. It still matters. Look at how people get what they're owed, and this should shape the life of the church. So for us, when we read the Old Testament laws, it really should have an effect on us, the law always outlines Israel's response to the gospel of grace. And for New Testament believers, we have seen the greatest sign of grace, the fulfillment of grace in Jesus Christ, which means of all people, we should be people whose lives are changed down to the details. What does this mean to have our lives changed to the details, and where does this show up? Well, you could spend a great deal of time looking at the New Testament commands. The New Testament in- includes all sorts of commands, requirements for God's people. But actually in Deuteronomy, in these seven chapters, Moses outlines for us four key categories that shape the Israelites' life and should shape our life today if we've been saved by Jesus, places where redemption begins to change the details of our interaction. And these are the four places that we see most of these laws fall into one of these categories, is that redemption changes our civil life, our religious life, our family life, 
and our sexual life. In other words, following Jesus, being saved by God, changes how you live in society, at work, and in the marketplace. It changes how you relate and respond to God religiously. It changes how you view dating, marriage, gender, sexuality, parenting. It changes all of these things. And it does it because at the heart of these principles of change is the truth that Moses reminded us of a couple chapters ago where he opened up a passage of law and he says, you are children of the Lord your God. This means because we have been made children of God, what happens in public, what happens in private, what happens in the confine of your own bedroom is viewed differently because of the way in which God has made you a child. You view your life forever from salvation onward through the lens of God's love for you which adopted you through Jesus Christ. And we live differently because we are defined differently. This is how Paul uh, opens this portion of, uh, when we went through Ephesians, he gets into a bunch of obligations and a bunch of responses, but look at how he opens it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Being loved by God changes all the spheres of our life. Now, this doesn't happen all at once. It happens slowly, and it happens over time. My wife and I have seen documentaries or read online or in magazines or heard on the radio, all sorts of things about how single-use plastic bags are killing our environment. And we've heard it for so long and we've started to, to see things on our own that now we're at a place where when we go to a grocery store and they ask us if we want a bag, we pause and we look at what we have and we say, I don't need a bag for this. In light of what we're knowing, it's starting to change how we're living. And this is the way that the gospel over time begins to leak into all the other areas of our lives. When it comes to our business, when it comes to the degrees we're pursuing, when it comes to our thoughts on dating, when it comes to the way we view even our own identity and sexuality, the gospel grants us a pause to just stop and to say, I think the gospel has something to say about this. I think knowing what Jesus has done actually changes how I interact in this moment. Have you had times like that? And if not, what does it take to build those pauses into your life to say, the gospel means something here? And I need to think about what that means and, and follow it accordingly. Because this is how Jesus wants us to read Deuteronomy 19 through 25. They show the beautiful righteousness of Jesus, of what he fulfilled, but they also show the way in which our redemption changes our lives across the board. The seemingly ordinary details are conformed to the obedience of following God. The primary principles of the law are Jesus' righteousness and our response to his grace. That's what it's after. The law shows when you're reading it the righteousness of Jesus and your response in grace. Grace changes us. And you can't lose sight of this priority. And this is why Moses goes where he goes in chapter 26. And this is where we see in closing the priority of the law. After Moses spends what's probably an hour um, not summarizing uh, seven chapters worth of law, but preaching seven chapters worth of law to his congregation, this is how he begins to button up the section what Paul read for us earlier, chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of your ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket. And you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I declare today that the Lord your God, or I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord. And you shall make response before the Lord your God. And this is what you'll say A wandering Aramean was my father. He went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us. 
and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with deeds of great terror, signs, and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner who is among you. So I love what Moses is doing here. He knows we're human. He knows that any time you listen to somebody talk for what's probably several hours at this point in time, specifically when the substance of what's being communicated are laws on laws on laws, that you might be prone to view law-keeping and covenant obedience as a burden. That maybe, like you in your 8 a.m. biology lecture, you're looking across over the Jordan, over the river into the promised land with eyes glassed over, thinking this is going to be great. And Moses is like, I need to lighten the mood. Let's talk about tithes for a minute. (laughs) But that's where he goes. But what's interesting is is maybe you felt it when we read it. There really is a miracle in this tithe giving. There is something worthy of celebration. There is goodness to be rejoiced in. He says this. He says, one day you will get into the promised land. And not only will you be there, but you will be there long enough for your fields to produce fruit, for your livestock to produce offspring. And when that happens, you take that fruit, that offspring, and you go to the place And you offer them as a tithe. And for the first time in forever, you are not offering harvests as a wanderer. You are not offering the fruit of Egypt. You are offering the produce of your land. You are in the land. The land that God promised to give you. The land that time after time after time your sin prohibited you from getting to. God kept his covenant to you. And you're here. And what you offer is the fruit of God's promise. And then he says, you make a response. You, Israel, remind yourself of this. My father was a wandering Aramean. He started with nothing. His people grew up in slavery. But you, God, you heard our cries. You heard our oppression. You heard our toils. And you carried us here. And now we have cities of our own and produce of our own and a God of our own. You have fulfilled our wildest dreams. And this is proof. And Moses says to his people, do not forget in all of this law keeping, in all of this tithing, what God has already done. And he knows they need to be reminded of this constantly. That's what he spends the first 11 chapters on. Hey, Israel, you forget lots of stuff. Don't forget this. And we forget too. We forget what God has done. And this is why Moses transitions in the very last part. He steps aside from law giving and he begins to actually reaffirm this covenant here with Israel there, with Moses there, and with God there on the plains of Moab. And look at what he says beginning in verse 16 of chapter 26. This day, so this is Moses, the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and rules. What is he reflecting on? Everything from chapter 25 back to chapter 12. To do these rules, you shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared today that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commands and his rules and will obey his voice. And the Lord has declared today that you are a people for his treasured possession as he has promised you and that you are to keep all his commandments, and that he will set you in praise and in fame and in honor high above the nations that he has made, and that you shall be a people holy to the Lord your God as he has promised. So I hope you see the wonder of this text. And if you haven't, I want us to stop here until we get it. If you're someone who is always seeking 
to divide God as a God of grace in the New Testament, a God of wrath in the Old Testament. We need to see the goodness of this text. If you're someone who's constantly burdened, knowing that God has a righteous standard, that you're never going to meet it, and you're going to spend the rest of your life trying and trying and trying and trying, only to be disappointed, hear the good news of this text. Look at the beauty of this covenant that we saw in two parts. Part one, verse 17, Israel says, you are our God. And we will walk after you, we will walk in your ways, we will keep your statutes, and we will obey your voice. And then part two, God says, you are my people as I have promised you. Do you see the wonder of this? God's people say, we're your people, and we're going to do this, and this, and this, and this. And in response, God did not say, when you've done those things, then you'll be my people. Instead, he says, here, this day, you are God's treasured possession. Listen to this. With a lifetime of law-keeping yet to come, they have not even crossed their, their, their toe hasn't gotten wet in the river. It won't actually get wet in the river. Um, when they cross the river, all of that future is still there. A lifetime of law-keeping to be had, but in this moment, God stresses the reality that they are already God's chosen people. His love has made them his own. His promise has endured to his people. You see, the priority of God's law, when we read it and when we see it, is not what we have done for God or what we will do for God. It is always what God has already done for us in his promise. His promise to save in the Old Testament made fully visible in Jesus Christ in the new. That was true for Israel. It's true for you today. Why would God accept you? Because of what he's already done in Jesus Christ. Yet in this tension, this wonderful grace... God affirms the call to obey. And what's interesting is this call for obedience looks wonderful. Look back at verses 18 and 19. And the Lord declared today that you are a people right now for his treasured possession, as he promised you, and that you are to keep all of his commandments, and that he will set you in praise and in fame and in honor high above all the nations that he has made, and you shall be a people holy to the Lord your God, As he has promised. It begins and ends with the promise of God. So I want to say this in closing. Is oftentimes when we talk about Christianity, when we talk about what it means to live out God's redemption in our life, it's really easy to focus and to say on what we don't have to do. That Christianity is the religion where you don't have to do anything. And that is true depending upon where you put that truth statement. Because if we are always reminding people of what we don't have to do as Christians, what might actually happen is that we not only confuse Christians, but we actually belittle God's grace in Jesus Christ. You don't have to do anything to be saved because you can't do anything to be saved. Jesus did all of the things for you. All you have to do is repent and believe in this wonderful Jesus, and that's it. But once you are saved, once you have been made a child of God, your relationship to obeying and to doing is different. My wife and I have started talking about uh, what it would mean and take to bring our kids to Disneyland. The (laughs) The problem is (laughs) that tickets to Disneyland, the cost to get there is expensive, especially with four kids. But now imagine if someone came to me and they said, I want to pay for your whole family to go to Disneyland. Flights, airfare and flights are the same thing. Flights, uh, entrance to the park, food, lodging, all of that. I just want to pay for it and I want you to go. What did I do to deserve that? Nothing. How How do I access this offer? How do I claim that in my life? I merely accept it. 
That's what salvation is. That's the good news of the gospel. Salvation is far too costly for you to get on your own, and it's a free gift offered to you in Jesus Christ to be claimed through faith. And at that moment in time, get out your soapbox, jump up and down, wave your arms and say, I don't have to do anything because Jesus has done it. But now, imagine if we get there and we walk into the park and Disney music is playing and I look at my kids and I say, kids, don't do anything. You don't have to do anything. And imagine if I go and I find them standing in a line, a long line, because those happen at Disneyland. And I say, what's wrong with you? Do you see how long this line is? Why would you do that? You don't have to do anything here. Come with me and let's just sit on this bench and let's just appreciate that we are here and we don't have to do anything. (laughs) That would be so confusing, wouldn't it? Because my children, when they're standing in line, aren't thinking in terms of obligation, they're thinking in terms of joy. For the first time, they get to do something that they were never able to do. And they say it's worth the long line because at the end is the promise of joy. And more important, not only does it confuse my children, but it belittles the gift. And it actually makes even less of the giver. Because why would that individual at such a costly price invite me here? so that I might enjoy it. So that I might, for the sake of freedom and joy, do things that without this gift are joyless and impossible. Even if it involves long, hard acts of standing in line in the hot sun, When you're in the park, everything is for joy. When God's gospel in Jesus Christ saves us through that costly work of substitution, our response to it is sometimes hard, sometimes difficult. Sometimes your feet get tired and your body begins to ache. But at the end of all of our obedience is the joy of this God. Friends, it is a privilege to obey a God like this. This is a gospel lifestyle. Obedience to God's command is part of our joy in being in the park. And yes, it's hard. And yes, it's scary. And yes, we can get nervous about it. And yes, we need the help of others. But at the end, we go to God with gifts which only he has given us. And we present it to him and we say, I am so thankful for this opportunity. I am so thankful that I am here. I am so thankful that you have provided. And the rest of my life is spent enjoying this beautiful gift of salvation. Now, I want you to think of this. We celebrate baptism. We rejoice, don't we? We rejoice with all the angels of the gift of joy that came in that moment of salvation. Just like the old song says, that moment I first believed. Man, what joy. Do you have that joy? Have you reflected on the wonderful joy that happened in the instance of your salvation? Now, if a moment of eternal salvation can bring joy of that size, imagine what obedience over a lifetime will yield. Joy upon joy upon joy upon joy. That's the goodness of this God. Brothers and sisters, the law of God reminds us that God is in the details. And in the gospel, we see the detailed weight of our sin, but we see the detailed grace which infuses every aspect of our life and changes it by the power of his Holy Spirit. So let's enjoy the park. And let's give grace to this God who has given us good things for our good and for his glory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how hard it is to deal with the law. 
Lord, in our Bible readings, we realize that sometimes it's hard to reconcile. Sometimes it's hard to interpret. In culture, as they see that this loving God of grace does give commands, it's hard to stand rightly on sound theology. But it's because the law is so difficult and demanding that we see the beauty of Jesus in fulfilling and sacrificing. And so Lord, I pray today that we simultaneously see the size of grace in Jesus Christ through the law so that we might with all of our hearts respond as the Israelites do and say, you are our God and we will walk in your ways and keep your statutes and your commands and we will obey your voice. And you will meet the cries of your faithful and you will say, you are my treasured possession as I have promised you. And you will keep the commands and I will set you in praise and fame and in honor high above the nations and you shall be a people holy to me as I have promised. I pray this in your name and for our joy. Amen. Amen.